Listen up. The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed in this podcast belong solely to the podcast participants and not to any participant's employer, organization, committee, or other group or individual. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. You know, for fun. So lighten up and enjoy. Oh, Stomping Jen. Oh my God, episode 88. Can you believe it? We've made it? it to episode 88 and we have a great episode for everybody. I'm excited. We're going to be talking about Pride Month and other cool stuff, I think. <laughs> right? It's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. And we have yes. two great guests with us. Yes, and I'm excited to get to our guests. The first guest. No, we're not going to say who oh, they are. Oh, we're it'll be a go. teaser. Okay. It's be a teaser. All right, here we go. All right. The Soft Serve Podcast. Creamy, delicious ideas without the creepy truck. The creamiest ideas. Awesome. And there is no creepy truck, so nobody worry. I wish there were some creepy trucks. We some went... Like creamy ice cream trucks. Come down my road, please. We went to a wedding once where they had an ice cream truck come, and that was awesome. Mm-hmm. Okay, Stomping Jen, we are here yes. with two great guests to help us talk about Pride Month. Our first guest is... Guess? Guest? Our first guest is a person known as Juicy D. We'll say hello to him in a minute. And our next guest is a local drag performer in western Massachusetts named... Whores Devores. I'm really excited to have both of these people here to say hello to us and to talk to us. Now, we will go first to Whores Devores to say hello and just tell us a little bit about yourself. Hello, I'm Whores Devores, here from the Western Massachusetts area been here about 14 years. I do local shows in the area, including Bon Appetit Burlesque, Drag Brunch with Whores and Friends, and the Divorce Court Charity Drag Show. I'm also on the board of director and directors and the main stage host for Northampton Pride. Well, thank you for joining us, Whores. Um, it's going to take me a minute to get used to that. <laughs> you love saying that. Yeah, I do You're love like, saying it. You get this look on your face. I know. I'm like, <laughs> I can't believe this is somebody's name and I get to say it. Yes. Um, no, thank you for joining us. Um, really excited to have you on here. Uh, mostly because I feel like I am... This is our first celebrity. I know. You're like we, went to see your, celebrity. we went to see your show. Um, about. <laughs> Go ahead. You went to my brunch show, right? Yes, yes. yeah. We went to the brunch yeah. show last a- summer. About this time last summer, and it was so much fun. So Yeah, we were child-free for a month, and we made it at, we put it on our calendar. We were like, we're going to the drag brunch. We're so excited. <laughs> yeah, That's so, the best way to come to drag brunch. Yeah, yeah it was, and it was a great time. Um, yeah. Hopefully, we'll get to talk a little more about that later. And our next guest is Juicy D. Hello, Juicy Hello, I do not have the same celebrity status <laughs> that Alex does. Um, I am a recovering sociology grad student, um, <laughs> getting over that. Um, <laughs> yeah, that is exactly the noise for that. Um, but I am a queer black male living in a very, very white and uh, nominatively nominally a uh, queer space. Mm-hmm. Um, I live in a city that has one ish gay bar uh, <laughs> <laughs> for a while it was zero. And before that was one ish. Oh <laughs> um, and you know, that's, that's how I've lived most of my life. Um, but have gone around to find other queer spaces quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And I think the dead giveaway for me is uh, I love cats. That's my mm. that's my thing. Show me cats, I'm happy. Well, <laughs> how many cats do you have? <laughs> None. Uh, I have two cats. Okay. I have an old four. I have a 14 year old cat and a four year old cat. Uh, you're... If I could, I would have a thousand more. But yeah, that's a two is a reasonable amount of cats. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it was a good starting point, and as soon as I have a house with enough space, it'll be like nine, and that'll be oh, fine. Oh, awesome. Yeah. He's my kind of peeps. Yeah. Um, <laughs> whores, do you have any pets? I have one dog and a husband. <laughs> <laughs> sort of like a pet, as <laughs> like, um, Stomping beautiful. Jen will attest. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah, we have, a, we have a pod dog and three pod cats. Yes, um, if we, we're, we would have more cats, I think. Yeah, we would. But if we're lucky, <laughs> maybe one will make its appearance at some point. Yes. And we have two pod children who <laughs> I don't think will make an appearance, but it's not out of the question. <laughs> so. It's a true story. That. Yeah, well, thank you both um, for, again, for joining us. And I just want to say to our listeners, as I do at the beginning of every episode... Um, please subscribe to us on your favorite podcasting app. We're on Apple, Google, Podbean, Stitcher, all of them. We're even on Spotify. You can get us there, too. You can stream us there. Um, subscribe and um, download the episodes and tell a friend about us. Right, Stomping Jen? Yes, always tell a friend. Yes. Tell we want to, many friends. To spread the good word about the Soft Serve podcast. Yeah. Yeah, so um, we talked about this before. It's Pride Month. It's mm-hmm. June. It's June. And we were talking last week. Was it last week about the um, Supreme Judicial Court ruling on workplace protections for um, LGBTQ um, people? Was it last week or the week before? It happened last week. It was last week. It was like Tuesday or Wednesday. Yeah. It was a good month for such a thing to happen. Yeah. In Pride Month. So, I, you know, I just wanted to ask the question, um, what Pride Month is? I wanted to ask um, whores, um, Juicy D, if you could tell, tell us, tell our listeners, talk a little bit about um, what Pride Month is and why we, why we celebrate it now, if, that, if there's a reason why. Yeah. I'm hitting to you, Dan. I just <laughs> need to say. <laughs> yeah, um... I mean, I guess the first thing to note is that Pride Month is canceled and it's now Gay Wrath Month. Um, <laughs> so, so I just want—I want to make sure that came through. It's—it's it's Gay Wrath Month. Yes, Gay Wrath, as in <laughs> out in the streets, loud and proud. It's—it's it's no longer just about being happy, but about demanding rights for everybody. Yeah. So taking the same energy that sort of started this all, um, and saying like, well, things have improved a little bit. Like it was—it's great to finally after. Uh, you know, let's say 400 years of this country being a thing to no longer be allowed to fire a person because they're because of their sexual orientation. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's a lot more to the fights. Um, but to jump back, let's say, I guess the easiest way is to start Stonewall and then go earlier. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. You're the uh, sociologist, were, right? So you can take us through this. You're the best yep. candidate to take us through this. Yeah, we're going to follow your lead on this. <laughs> I don't I don't want to out anybody, but I'm not the only sociologist. Uh-oh. Over here. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Out of the same program. I'm not going to name any names. <laughs> 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 um, but um, the, the short version of this is that uh, in 1969, um, there were... To set the scene, um, there were gay bars all across um, the country, but they were relatively small in number. Um, They were underground. Uh, They were mostly run by the mafia, um, who found that they could profit off of um, gay folks. Um, And they were routinely uh, raided by the police. And the police would do this because it was very legal to fire people. It was very legal to discriminate um, in terms of housing, in terms of pretty much everything. And the police would do that. These were the bottom rung. Like you wouldn't, you wouldn't fight an arrest. (laughs) You wouldn't fight tickets um, that you got. And what they would do is they would go into the bars. They would round up everybody. They would um, have them stand outside, line them up. 
so that the press could take pictures and could out all of these people um, and destroy their lives. And there was a bar um, in New York. It was the Stonewall Inn. Um, they mostly served um, people who were poor. There was drag queens, um, some of whom were performers. Some of them, I think we would now call transgender or trans, um, trans folks. Um, so these were, you know, the most vulnerable of the most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. uh, and one beautiful, amazing person, um, Marsha P. Johnson, um, as the story goes, threw the first brick in that riot. But um, it occurred when the police came in and um, they started to pull, to start dragging people out, um, including um, there was a lesbian who was being dragged out. Um, and they started to fight back. They said, we've had enough of this. Um, so they beat the cops, threw them out of the bar, blockaded the bar, <laughs> um, and all of this was happening at a really contentious time. There was a lot of energy because a lot of people were tired of being continually harassed and beaten by the police, sometimes murdered by the police. Uh, this should sound familiar if you're mm -hmm. living in the U.S. now. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, that there was a lot of this anger and a lot of this frustration, and it all sort of boiled out. Um, and so at first, it was just the people who were barricaded within the bar as the police response came in, so did the resident response and all of the people who lived around this bar. And they started to show their numbers, which were much larger than the, uh, the cop numbers. And Juicy, what city was this in again? I'm sorry New if you York. said oh, New sorry. York. Okay. New York City. Yep. New York City. <laughs> Pay attention, uh, yeah. Salty. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't think I said it. That's my bad. No, you <laughs> did, because I, I heard you. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, maybe I did. <laughs> it's okay. Keep going. Um, but that... They pushed the police out, and for days there were riots. Um, this was, I believe it was four days, four days, three days, four days. Um, but where they were tipping over cars, lighting them on fire, every time the police pushed in, the, the queer people of that space would push you back um, until finally things calmed down. Um, but the idea was this was the birth of gay liberation. So before that, there was the homophile movement, um, which in terms of like a, in terms of civil rights was sort of pretty tame. Mm -hmm. um, they would still hold pickets and protests and they would say things like, please stop, please stop hitting us with batons. Um, the gay liberation movement pushed a little beyond that mm -hmm. and started saying, no, fuck this. Yeah. <laughs> um, and very much that it's not just, we aren't just meek, we are strong, we are a large group of people, and we are tired of all of this. Um, so we are demanding equality across the board, uh, which was a radical thing to say. Yeah, I, and, and I think as a, as a um, cis male, um, like heterosexual person who came up in our, you know, systemic um, white educational system. I never heard of this um, event until right until I got to college and began taking classes on a campus where there was a Stonewall Center, for example. And I was exposed to some education about this. I mean, I, nary mm -hmm. nary a whisper yeah. in my eighteen years of life prior to that of anything ab about this that um that lgbtq folks had to have you know a um a revolution of some sort to begin even you know having the conversation like that yeah. in, or raise awareness that of, of the fact that um there's this kind of oppression going on i mean i got lucky um so i have or had uh, two gay uncles who were pretty radical. Mm -hmm. um, and so I got an education both from knowing that they existed and everything that they dealt with. And my mother, who was pretty aware that I was not straight <laughs> from an early age and went like, all right, here's, here's your history. Yeah. See, that is like, I, I had the same experience as a... Uh, Saw too. Name now. Sawtooth. Sawtooth. <laughs> Sawtooth. 
And that I, you know, I grew up in the South on military bases throughout the country. I didn't have any experience with gay history whatsoever. So I was 18 going to college, learning those same things. Like what? Mm -hmm. Does this exist? We can fight back. Mm -hmm. I was so used to hiding that, you know, that kind of knowledge that those spaces and those moments have existed is really important to queer youth. Yeah. Now did, um, did discovering that help you in some way in your own life in terms of um, how you saw yourself in the world? And did it, did it, did it make you feel stronger having learned about that movement? I think for me, pride in general, even what pride has become in some places, which is kind of a corporate garbage mess, um, pride in general is helpful because it helps you see people like you. Like if I was a little kid going to Northampton Pride and I saw a bunch of people, a bunch of different shapes and sizes and colors and ages, it would make me feel so good just to know that, you know, yeah, there's this 65 year old person here. I'm only 10 right now, but someday that could be me. Mm-hmm. Like I didn't have those role models growing up. I thought I was going to die young and I thought it was going to be a hate crime. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Jeez. Now did Stonewall, did the, did the actions at the Stonewall Inn in 1969 spill out beyond New York city? Did they help, um, embolden um, LGBTQ people in other parts of the country stand up and demonstrate. And I'm just curious if that, and yeah. if that helped, was it, yeah, was it I mean, an igniter? Yeah, I think um, Stonewall was sort of at the, the top, like the acme point of all of the frustration, but there were plenty of protests and actions and even riots before that. So the Compton Cafeteria riots happened a couple of years before that. Um, that's in um, California. And they were um, literally, it was a drag queen hitting a, hitting a police officer in the face with a, a mug, mm-hmm. uh, with a coffee mug. <laughs> so, and that, that sparked all of, the, um, all of the riots there. And that was, again, a neighborhood where all of the queer people, poor people, um, people of color had been shoved into subpar living conditions where they were constantly being harassed, um, constantly being um, beaten by the police, arrested for little or no cause, um, having economic, like there were no economic opportunities because you could just fire someone for whatever you wanted to. Um, and this is something that had been going on for years. Um, I mean, if we go back even, even before World War I, there were groups that had organized around queer rights and gay rights. Uh, some of them were a little more, or not, I'm not even going to sugarcoat it. Some of them were boys clubs. Uh, mm-hmm. So there was the Mattachine Society that was really white gay men um, with money. Um, and they had their own set of concerns. Um, the, when lesbians tried to join or wanted to join, they got told no. So they made their own daughters of... Um, Oh God, what is it? Uh, Daughters of Belial? Daughters of uh, something. Oh, I should know my history better. Um, (laughs) But they founded their own club. (laughs) uh, Can you cut that part out? Oops. Uh, Horace, do you know? (laughs) I got you. Yep. Your history is already so much better than my history. (laughs) All right. Um, But yeah, um, the, that was at the apex of it. There were all of these other actions, all of these other groups that were concerned about it. And a lot of them sort of linked the same ideas that we do now um, with class, race, sex, um, the um, gender and transgender issues, gender nonconforming issues, um, marriage, adoption, and then really focusing on like youth, um, youth problems. So bullying, um, harassment, um, youth uh, homelessness, which is a big issue and always has been uh, because parents will look at their child and say, this one thing about you makes me angry <laughs> or mm-hmm. scared or whatever it is, and they'll disown them. And this yeah. is something that, that queer people have dealt with, at least here forever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so all of these issues that people were continuing to mobilize, but like there was just that moment. Um, if we want to make a current 
analogy, George, George Floyd's death Mm -hmm. and the reaction that people had immediately Mm -hmm. to that. It's the same thing. It's that it's all of the frustration that we've been venting sort of unleashed at once in one loud roar and it rippled across. Um, So not only did Stonewall occur, but there were also other actions. There was a lot of political organizing. There was a lot of just, just demands um, being made across the board. And that's where we get to the, the next pride and the celebration, which was a protest. It was very much just a, we are here, here are our numbers. Mm-hmm. Um, and here's our list of demands. Mm-hmm. So, right, but even when we think about those first prides, we don't think about them in the same way we do today. You know, Northampton had a very strong history of people marching with bags over their heads because they were afraid of being persecuted. They were afraid of things happening to them. And even post Stonewall, you see things like the upstairs lounge in Louisiana, a gay bar that the police or whoever sets ablaze with everyone inside, barring people from leaving, and like these huge massacres that continue to exist as we start to protest and riot and really fight back. Yeah. There's there's no shortage of uh, of problems that have continued. So Pride um, was originally a protest. It was originally an action meant to confront and disrupt. Um, Its existence is still important because there are still those same problems mm-hmm. um, yeah. all across the board. So yeah. even though we do have things to celebrate, it's the fight's not over. No. Yeah. And I, I was, I was thinking about that, right. About some of the progress that has been made, you know, I think in the last, you know, 10 years with the Supreme judicial court rulings about um, validating same sex marriage, the recent, um, ruling uh about um civil and human rights in the workplace how yeah. we can't you know fire was, people for being gay what i was going to say though is it was on the backs of terrible news about health insurance right and uh, you know yes. gender lines and all of that you know like yeah and I'm so glad- it's like steps forward and then like steps right. backwards I'm all glad- the time yeah and i'm glad you brought that up because one, one of the one of one of the questions i think that i wanted to ask was we, we see these big stakes in the ground that say, you know, progress has been made, right? And, you know, people who, people who are only uh, maybe tangentially concerned might think, well, you know, time to dust off the hands and we're done here, right? But what else, I mean, what else, what else is there left to do in terms of um, continuing to move the needle towards, you know, full equality? Oh God, there's so much. (laughs) It's such a big question, right? Because it varies very largely by region. You know, if I'm in a state that just outlawed gay adoption, which happened, what, two weeks ago? I don't remember the state, Tennessee, Kentucky, one of those states, Tennessee. Like my, my fight is, doesn't feel the same from where I'm at in Massachusetts, but it is the same fight. And, you know, our trans community is so vulnerable right now. They're fighting so many legal and political battles that everyone needs to support them on. Mm -hmm. Like we call ourselves the LGBTQ plus community now. And I feel like that community really needs to rally together behind trans lives, especially behind black trans lives who are the most vulnerable of any population. Yeah. And And, go ahead. uh, Juicy. I just want to to echo that all of those fights, uh, when you look back at who is on the forefront, it is trans women of color, it is trans men, it is um, queer people of color that are out on the forefronts of pretty much every social movement in terms Mm -hmm. of progress that has been made. And they are still the most vulnerable, but they also do, they're able to see all of the connections because all of these forces of oppression are on them. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it makes it very salient, whereas some of us have privileges that sort of make that invisible or less real. Um, You know, where I feel pretty comfortable walking outside holding my partner's hand. Mm -hmm. And he loves to do that. I hate it because it's sweaty hands. (laughs) 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 Like if we're walking around here, I feel pretty calm, pretty confident, pretty comfortable. Right. right? And in most places, um, in this area but 
there have been times where I've traveled and been like, oh, maybe, maybe we don't want to do that right now. Like mm-hmm. looking right. around the area real quick and seeing, you know, but I mean, we are an interracial and queer couple. That is, <laughs> right. that is a double on some people's lists. So like remembering that it's, glo- it's, well, it's both regional here and a, like globally, it's an yeah. issue. Yeah. Was So this, I have a question. <laughs> uh, you mentioned uh, this like group that existed for white gay men um, that, excluded lesbians back in before world world war one so is there like um uh these separations and these like categories within the lgbtq plus community where they look down upon each other or there's like this like in you know i'm better than you because i'm white and gay and opposed to all of that other (laughs) that is a great question you know (laughs) Gay people grow up in the same shitty system that we all grew up in. Yeah. They are, you know, through sometimes no fault of their own, racist, transphobic, homophobic, sexist. These things very much exist in the gay community. And, you know, especially in the white gay community mm-hmm. and especially in the white gay male community. I think, uh, you know, the purveyors of the most judgment and criticism against their own kind of community is white gay males because they operate from this place of privilege. And I say this as a white passing gay male, Mm -hmm. right? Like I, (laughs) not gay male. I don't know. It's just, it's a complicated fucked up situation. Yeah. I can imagine. Am I not the first one here? I didn't ask beforehand. Oh yeah, absolutely. You can. Yeah. What was that? Uh, he uh, asked if he could curse. Oh. Yeah. Yep. No, absolutely. <laughs> yes. I mean, they asked if they could curse. Yes. Sorry. Um, it's. I just called yep. myself a gay male, so I don't even know where I'm at today. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, and again, it for me, it for me, it, it underscores, um, you know, the, the need for consciousness around, yes. you know, um, you know, respecting people's identity and how right. they, how, you know, right. how they want to be seen in the world yeah yeah so my apologies <laughs> well it's funny too because yeah. like we've talked about this i think before previously i'm not mm-hmm. sure in what context but yeah. this idea that um this gender fluidity while it might be not a new, new idea but over the last um i don't even know 10 years i can't even tell you how long where it's been more I don't want to, I hesitate to use the word acceptance, but like, it's much more of a, a not a newer type of language for people that we've been exposed to as a society that is easier for children, I think, to very quickly adapt to, as opposed to people like us in our forties, where it's like a new language that we have to learn. Um, this, this like idea about gender as fluidity and mm-hmm. non-binary as a concept yeah. you're not alone right. we're learning it all together i right. just came up with non-binary like two weeks ago and it, the language for it i don't even think existed for me when mm-hmm. i was younger so we're all learning in this together right yeah and um i want to say congratulations um is i have a i have another acquaintance who a, a few months many months ago um came out um as non-binary and you know i had never had that conversation with another person before and i just i just said i'm gonna expose my vulnerability here i don't know if i should say congratulations to you i want to and they said yeah absolutely Mm -hmm. you know i'm feeling you know proud about this and that's why i'm telling you and sharing it and yeah so yeah yeah but moment you're coming into your own skin in a way like you're really yeah. feeling who you are for the first time and i will say thank you for that congratulations every single time <laughs> sure um yeah but, but like my larger point was yeah. like you know like like i feel like our kids like you know if if there's a a, a friend of theirs who decided i want to be referred to as they them it's so much easier, I think, for the children to like get that and, and to correct us when we say it incorrectly. Yeah. You know, it's, I don't know. I don't know what that is. I don't even know what I'm trying to say. No, I think, <laughs> I think I know what you're trying to say. Um, 
you know, I, I think, I think children, I mean, for the most part, I don't want to generalize children, but right. I think in my experience anyways, children are pretty open mm-hmm. to new ideas if they're in an environment where they can explore them and consider them in a kind of non-threatening way. Right. Right. And they're not having, um, uh, competing ideas pushed upon them. Right. Yeah. In, in a way that they think they have to accept those competing ideas. So, yeah. yeah. Um, but I wanted to mention like the idea though of gender, um, fluidity or even, um, a, a, a non-binary type mm-hmm. of gender is not a new idea. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's as ancient. No, yeah. It's as ancient as human civilization itself, right? We just happen to live in a society that that values binary, dichotomous thinking. You know, right. God, God, the devil. You know, black, white, right, right Good, wrong. Bad. Everything has to be categorized into a binary, including... And put people into buckets. Yeah, including gender and sexual preference. You know, I think mm-hmm. um, it's that, you know, it, it's that kind of, uh, I'll call it Judeo-Christian need to categorize everything as either... Well, is this, it Judeo-Christian or is I, it just... That's just what I'm calling it. <laughs> yeah. I blame everything on the Judeo-Christians. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, and that, that, that's, so that's an interesting question. I mean, you know, one of the things is there, can you think of a, can you think of a, a way to help people who might struggle with that concept that, um, gender might be something other than, you know, male and female, um, you know, get them to a place where they can think that maybe there, there, there is something else, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. You know, <laughs> I'm, I don't have any experience educating in this space. So I'm, I'm asking that question kind of, um, from a naive point of view. I mean, I'll say from teaching these kinds of things to, um, undergraduates in, at a large university, uh, I don't think there's anything that works super well. If people are resistant to it, they are going to resist. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you give them information, um, they tend to sort of dig their heels in. Yeah. <laughs> um, a lot of times it falls into this idea of like, well, there's a biological sex because that's what I learned about in elementary school, middle school, right. high school. And that's true. And I think, our responsibility is to sort of, first off, disentangle sex and gender, right? right? So sex is more on the biology and gender is about the roles and the meanings that that takes, but also to bring social sciences into critique biology and its, its understanding. And biology has already done that, right? So when someone says there are two sexes, there are so many more than two mm-hmm. sexes all across the animal kingdom. Yeah. But even within a human being, yeah. There are six different types of sex that can be measured. You have nuclear sex. You have a chromosomal sex. You have an endocrino- endocrino- blah, 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 endocrinological sex. You have a nuclear sex. Um, you have... Um, I like the fish- sound of nuclear sex. It is <laughs> not as fun as it sounds. <laughs> In your cells. Yeah. Um, but all of these different things that don't actually have to match in an individual human being. Um, we're finding out a lot more about how chromosomal sex does not match what you physically manifest as, especially in women, because they tend to be the ones who seek out infertility treatment. And one of the things they test for is which chromosomes you have. And we found out that there are so many women living with male chromosomes who identify as female. They've lived their lives as it. It's what works for them. It's everything else in their body screams it, but this one thing. Mm-hmm. So it, I think I did the math out. You need 36 genders to encompass all of the, or 36 sexes to encompass all of these different combinations of things um, or more. And we're at a point where we really have to say like, this binary doesn't work <laughs> for anybody. Right. Um, in pe- terms of getting people on board with it, I usually just say, think of it like a nickname. If somebody says, hey, call me this, no one seems to have a lot of problem. 
Right. Um, yeah. That, that's my. I mean, and, and for people who are like in the moment having a problem, don't make a big deal about your mistake. Like if you misgender someone, correct yourself immediately, move on with the conversation. Like no one wants to hold your gender hand while you weep gender tears about you misgendering <laughs> someone. Yeah. Like we don't want to have to do the work for you. So if you call me he and I say, oh, actually it's they, then you come back with the same sentence and say they. That's all you have to do. Right. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think, Stomping Jen? Hi. <laughs> you're throwing yeah. me off because you're looking at me searchingly like you want yeah. me to like come up with the next thing. <laughs> no, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm processing here. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and, and I think s people are so obsessed with genitals. Oh my God. Well, I read, uh, I'm sure yeah. there's more books on the topic, but I know I read um, years back Intersex by Jeffrey. You, yeah, that was popping Eugene. in my mind a few minutes ago, no, too. I can't say the name. Yeah. Um, but that was like an eye opening book that there were so many people who were born and then the choices made for them by a doctor. Like, oh, yeah. look, there's a penis and it's right. There we go. <laughs> like, yeah. Or whatever, you know. I mean, like, or we're going to, you know, we're going to make. Right. The genitals we think this person should have. Right. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> now. <laughs> That's all we have to say on that topic. Let's yeah. move on. No. Well, I, you know, and, and, I, and I was, I was thinking about the idea where I wanted to go with the idea that people are so obsessed with genitals and how that should be reflected in clothing, mm -hmm. toys, wallpaper, right? Pillow color. Like, you know, we, you know, I remember, you know, we our, our first, um, our first child um, we had was, was a boy. Mm -hmm. um, our second um, child, um, her sex is a female. And I remember we made like really deliberate attempts. Like we're going to not give um, her everything that's pink. We're not going to do all the stuff like that you do for a, you know, uh, doing air quotes here, a girl baby, um, you know, uh, let her play with the boy toys and vice versa for our son and all of that. Um, but still like the societal pressure, like from, you know, um, the, the daycare and all of that stuff. Like mm -hmm. she just wanted all of that girl stuff, you know, oh, and it, her girl, her girly phase. Yeah. And it just, it was so strong. And, and I remember us, but I remember us making a deliberate choice to try not to push that, you know, but it's and still, my favorite color is black. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we did something. I right? don't know. I don't know if that's true, but no, uh, yeah, so... I don't know if there's a right or a wrong either, because she could be as girly or not girly as she wants to be, and same for our son. Yeah. I mean, but that's the right answer, right? You, they can be as girly or as not girly yeah. as they want to be. My right. parents tried to do something similar, where I had to play with boy toys. I needed to play sports. Man, that was successful. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, yeah, I still loved my My Little Ponies. I would go over to my neighbor's house and play with their Barbies, but I would also play with my He-Man and my mm -hmm. Thundercats or whatever. You know, kids are going right. to make up their minds, whatever messages they get or not. Right. Yeah. <laughs> You're looking at me again. Yeah. <laughs> I like to look at you. You have good ideas. Oh, I do? Yes, you do. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um <laughs> you're getting stuck you have like yeah. a list of questions i know Why? i feel like there's more to say about that well, um, well then say more yeah um did you feel as a child that you were engendered upon me oh for sure um i have to be careful here um yeah i mean I, and, and i got i got message you know i got messages mm -hmm. you know that um 
if I acted too feminine or I, you know, if God forbid I acted in a way, you know, that was, you know, I'm going to say this cause it's not, they're not my words, you know, they're act in a way that was gay or looked girly, you know, I would get thrown through a window, mm-hmm. that type of stuff, you know? Um, so, you know, for a, I mean, that's terrifying. Mm-hmm. Right. And I, and I'm, and I'm not a particularly masculine person. <laughs> you know, I, I have a, ve- that's true. I have a very slight bone structure, <laughs> you know, um, he's a delicate bird. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh my. <laughs> yeah um you know but I, I, yeah what was the question <laughs> <laughs> you're the worst why am i the worst i don't know <laughs> what were you asking me i i said did you feel engendered upon as a child yeah absolutely a hundred percent you know i think um so there was like the in-home stuff the in-home pressures right and um there, there were the social pressures too. Like, you know, I, I grew up in the the seventies and eighties and, you know, it was okay to be openly, um, openly homophobic. I mean that, I think that's how at the time I, my observation would be that, um, any questions or concerns about a person's, you know, gender expression would be expressed. It just in, you know, straight out virulent homophobia. You know, like that person is an F word or, you know, whatever, you know, that's, that was my experience. Yeah. So, I don't know. It's um, interesting. Like where I grew up, there wasn't, um, a lot of openness around LGB. I can't, sorry. Yeah. It's like such a long acronym that I always forget the letters LGBTQ. Um, there wasn't a lot of openness around that topic in the area I grew up in at yeah. all. Um, but I remember, like, in high school, like, there was a rumor that I was a lesbian. Yeah. How but I wasn't. Feel, how like, I, but I didn't that? care. Right. Right? Like, so I didn't <laughs> care, but I wasn't. Yeah. I don't know why people thought that, though. Right? That's crazy. In high school, there was a rumor I was a big old queer, too, but <laughs> that was... <laughs> in elementary school and middle school and high school... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, to be honest, like, I don't think I would have known, you know, I was a very, like, late bloomer when it came to oh, that's true. to my own sexuality. That is true. I mean, it's no mistake, you know, like, I, I've talked about this on this podcast before, you know, um, Stomping Chen, Jen is the virginity stealer, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, but, but I, I mean, I think in these conversations, like, it's, I think it's, it's important you know, to be, for me anyways, to be honest about that yeah. stuff, like not every, not every male is, you know, a sexual conqueror in their teens and twenties. You know, I, I, you know, I didn't know. And maybe, you know, maybe a lot of that, um, maybe a lot of that was grounded in fear of even exploring what my identity was because I lived in such a, um, fearful environment. Right. Right. Yeah, so I don't know it, that, that. I don't know. I feel like I brought that up because it was more predominantly like you know back in the eighties and the nineties. You know, nineties when I was in high school, yeah. and it just wasn't. It wasn't like a thing. That I think the the needle has moved in such a direction that it's not as the kids today. While there's still, obviously, still lots of bullying and. Um, discrimination that occurs in that community i just think that it's not the needle has moved in a direction where it's not people people are more willing to come out maybe it's just the area that we live i think also like you said it's regional too you know i grew up in new jersey you know and now we live here so i, I see that all around us we live in a pretty quote unquote progressive yeah. little bubble here in yeah. the in the valley. But it was interesting. Right. I wrote this down too, Juicy, when you were talking about that there was one bar or one space, queer space in the valley or in in Northampton particularly. Is there more than in the valley itself or is it just the one or there's two? A, like there's a strip club in Springfield. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. What we got. Yeah. <laughs> There were, there were a few more 
um, earlier. So like when I was sort of just at the age where I could, well, not could, just at the age that I would sneak into bars. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> I mean, I've looked like I was 38 since I was 17 <laughs> me for a while. Yeah. Like just, um, but there were like, it was all stars in Springfield mm-hmm. and that would go. Mm-hmm. Um, it was divas in Northampton, yeah. which, you know, was a nice little, I mean, it advertised itself. It said like, I, this is where the gays are. Right. But all stars closed. Um, divas is closed. Yeah. A lot of the places um, that were around didn't survive. Yeah. And so now we're, we're pretty reduced. Yeah. Even yeah. even though even though there is such a seemingly large community of people who support who are supportive of that, yeah, there's I mean there's a lot of different weight like there's a lot of different roles that gay bars served mm-hmm. in the community. Mm-hmm. So on the one hand, it was a bar and it was a place to go out at night, but it right. was also a place to meet and see other people in a safe place. Right. It was at a time when you couldn't date someone openly, yeah. or you couldn't. Um, you know, have a relationship at all. It was a place to still find sexual release. Mm-hmm. Um, for a lot of bars, it was a place to organize mm-hmm. as well. Um, and as the internet has changed things, yeah. um, mm-hmm. including how people meet each other, that's yes. one aspect of it. Um, but there's also, in Northampton, you're not going to find a lot of bars that say no gays. Right. So it's um, not like that there's not a gay bar. It's just that there are bars. Right. Right. Even it, though say that oh like, no. it's wrong. So like you need queer spaces mm-hmm. to feel safe. If I go to the tunnel bar yeah. and I'm feeling with my friends, I feel relatively safe until the bro who's had too many martinis tries to like say something homophobic. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's people say this thing in Northampton and it makes me crazy because I'm from the South. They yeah. say every bar in Northampton's a queer bar. And I'm like, fuck you. It's right. not, it's right. not the same thing at all. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, like they're not passionate about it. <laughs> yeah, no, there's not active discrimination in a lot of like from the establishments themselves. A lot of times, at least in the patrons that come in, but even the events that they hold or right. what they'll allow to happen in that bar right. um, is going to change or in that space, in that event space is going to change. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it does serve a real purpose. There is a super, I don't know how to describe it, that there's a different energy when you walk into a space and you know, these are all my people. Right. It feels safe. Yeah. It just feels safe. I do most of my shows in VFWs and God bless them for having me, Mm -hmm. but I don't feel safe there. Yeah. Yeah. Like I walk through the main bar of the VFW on the way to my banquet hall. I have to meet these judgmental. Yeah airs from old dudes who are like why is this queer here i'm in full drag walking through the bmw making them a bunch of money but it's it's not the same as if i walk into the majestic saloon in downtown northampton i'm like oh hey my people are here right and is there i think i heard this somewhere or in like some show i was watching where like it really is problematic when a bunch of you know a um or is probably for some of the reasons you mentioned before, but when a bunch of, you know, stray people show up and try to crash, you know, what is a queer space? That, that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, 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 I love to handle straight people who misbehave in queer spaces. Yeah. It's one of my favorite things to do. But yeah, it's really problematic yeah. a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It, and and I, then, the I can, and then I can imagine you get into issues around um, uh, uh, fragility you know, like, I don't know if it's, I don't know if you want to call it straight fragility or what, what the right term for it is. Right. But, um, you know, I, I, I would, I think, I think no straight person could, could argue that there aren't enough spaces out there for, for us in the world. No, right. Straight people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, that they were, there were the group that, uh, they held their straight pride parade in Seattle, all one of them. Oh my God. <laughs> Yeah, Asian khaki pants. Oh like, my God. You can tell he had no gay friends because someone would have said, "Why do you look like that?" <laughs> yeah. have, a little, have a little fun. It's supposed to be a celebration, and all you did was come out in sand-colored pants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway. 
Have you been to the the basement? What is the the name of that? Uh, it's like monthly, right? They have a. Uh, well, the the basement is um, it's just the bar in Northampton. Yeah. Um, but they have all sorts of different nights. They have uh, one night that's um, sugar biscuit. That's yeah, a sugar beer. biscuit. Yeah. Yeah. So they do that. They do a number of things. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a nice space. Mm-hmm. And when you walk in there, it's mostly queer people, which is really nice. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's also in a weird place because it's right next door to the police department. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and that whole system of bars is owned by some predatory people that yes. a lot of us boycott. Yes, I know who that is. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> My, I used to work many years ago when I was in school. I worked oh, for we'll that. Just, we'll just call them that real estate developer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a time. sure thing we all know who we're talking about. <laughs> no, let's just leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> but even even in those spaces, when you're talking about like, you know, straight people being there, mm-hmm. that there were clearly people who, like, every time that I've gone, there are clearly people who are straight and who have decided that they were just going out for the night and went to that bar. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and instead of being like a really fun, energetic, like, look, here are all these different exp- expressions. Here's someone who's got like a ton of makeup on and they look fabulous and I want to talk to them. All of a sudden, you're really conscious of the fact that people are taking pictures and you're not, mm, not like, safe. It's not taking like a selfie, like really happy with you. It's taking a picture of you, like you're yeah. on display. Yeah. And that really changes the feeling yeah. where it's like, I did get dressed up to be seen, but I got dressed up to be seen and appreciated by the people that I right. know and like right. not, not to be an animal on display. Yeah. yeah. It's fucked up. Do you think, um, sorry, just to get back, cause you mentioned the internet. Um, so I know I once went out with um, three gay gentlemen, friends of mine, and I got a schooling on grinder <laughs> by them. Yeah. <laughs> they were, uh, they, they were sure to tell me all about it. And, all the people around me that were like checking I, out the grinder app and I was like, Oh, I don't know what you guys are talking about. I feel about. like I missed an awesome conversation. Oh my god, yeah. It was ridiculous. Um is that something that has changed uh or is that like a complimentary thing to like having queer spaces? Because I've heard that, you know, I heard really clearly when you were saying that those spaces are um, you know, vital and important um safe spaces. But is that like something that has changed the dynamic where um, uh, it, it's not needed, quote unquote, you know, I don't know what I'm trying to say, but is that something? Yeah, I mean, the, there's a <laughs> plethora of like the Internet changed dating for everybody. Right. But especially for people who were sort of on the margins, because mm-hmm. it was a way to connect with people who you didn't know. Right. There was no like easy way if you're walking down the street to know. Um, if somebody was part of your community or not. Right. Grinder, Jacked, Hornet, Scruff, Growler. Hornet. Man. Yeah, Hornet. <laughs> I like I like that name. Hornet. Uh, okay. Go ahead. Sorry. There's also Jacked. Um, yeah, the, all of those different things. They do essentially the same thing, which is that they tell you how close someone is to you mm-hmm. um, and give you information about about them. Some of I mean, it could be for dating, it could be for a hookup, it mm-hmm. could be one that leads into the other however it is um but it did make it easier if if you were only going to a gay bar just to to cruise and find somebody Mm -hmm. um, that that would fill that role for you but i think it does go a lot more that people were still looking for a way to meet up with friends and to dance and to just feel like part of a group right Um, but there is a yeah there's there's a lot of facts (laughs) a lot of it is also I mean bars weren't the only place that people would have sex or would look to like there were all sorts of cruising spots Mm -hmm. um, all over that you would find out about this just made it a little bit easier and you could avoid those because they were still dangerous too yeah 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 I I also worked in retail and there was I worked at a Macy's and the men's bathroom in Macy's was a known hot spot for activity (laughs) Let's put it that way. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and, and I think that, that, I think that speaks maybe 
somewhat to the, you know, privilege Mm -hmm. that is pervasive in, in our, in our society for, you know, um, straight people who don't have to, you know, don't have to, don't have to worry about, you know, where they might be able to get together. Right. Um, or, um, I don't know what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I don't know who you're trying it's to say. Here, right? Like everywhere you yeah. go, there's potential straight people that you could potentially hook right. up with or date. Yeah. Or as you know, if I'm in a room, I don't know who's there. They're not mm-hmm. like signaling their homosexual light. Or, you know, it's like, I don't. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I feel like I missed out though on this internet dating stomping gin you want an internet date go ahead no i don't want to i'm just saying i feel like i'm i missed you feel like you missed the boat go ahead because we started we started dating in 1996 is that true yeah i mean before before there was even an internet (laughs) there was still aol chat rooms in oh no 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 No, i didn't even really exist there were like it at large university you had to go up into the library tower all the way to like the 15th floor and they had these little carousels where they had this like intranet that you could like access. <laughs> yeah. Oh boy. Oh, old people. Pre-internet. Yeah. yeah. So how do you make that noise? Which <laughs> oh, I don't have that sound effect. <laughs> um, oh boy. We've gotten away from the topic. Yeah. So, queer spaces it's important that we respect them right and not not crash them or go to check them out just because as right like, as like a is it okay if you're going along you know with a friend it, or you're invited right it depends on the space and it depends yeah. on how you're behaving yeah. <laughs> yeah so like at my brunch show for instance i think there's three kinds of people who come mm-hmm. there's the people who are queer and are like, yes, brunch, we need this. This is like a church experience for us. There's the people who are just like curious about it, but in a respectful way. And then there's the Beckys who come with their bridal shower, who get so drunk and try to dance on the other dancers Mm -hmm. and try to like be part of the show. And you just don't want to be the Beckys from the bridal shower. Mm -hmm. As long as you're not that person and you're respecting the space, to me, it's a welcoming environment. Yep. In whores, I think if 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 I'm remembering correctly from attending your show, you address that right up front, kind of at the beginning of the show. Like you're you're very straightforward about that. Yeah, with everything I do, I make sure the audience knows the rules because I can't assume that anyone's ever been to a show before, and I can't assume that whoever's show it was taught them the right thing to do. Because there's a lot of bad information out there. So we talk about consent. Mm -hmm. Uh, not only in like interactions with each other, but in interactions with our performers, because consent is always, always, always important. Yeah. Now for, for people who may not know, I think most people think they know what drag is, right? They have an idea in their head about what it is, but I want to, I want to ask somebody who does this, um, as a, as a, as an artist, you know, what is it? What is drag? I think there's also a lot of ways to think about drag. Yep. Um, some of them I very much disagree with and some of them I'm mm. all for. But drag for me is mm. an exaggerated presentation of gender. It's about creating a character who has kind of like a backstory and a, a personality and takes these things that we take for granted in society and throws a little glitter on them, makes them five times as big as they should be and just really takes society's gender norms and critiques them while playing with them. Um, Juicy, do you have any experience doing um, drag performance? Are, are you, have you ever done that? Um, I would say I've done cross-dressing before, mm-hmm. um, usually as part of a costume, but not necessarily a full drag performance where I've created the character and gone out. Um, I have absolutely no problem wearing a dress or uh, wearing nails, doing makeup, anything like that. Um, just as regular as like my presentation for the evening. Mm-hmm. Um, I will wear heels if I can find ones that fit. <laughs> that's hard. Yeah. Well, 
I am fat and large, so. <laughs> um, What's your shoe size? Uh, oh, uh, 14 yeah. double wide in men's. Mm, yeah, see, I'm a 12 and a half double wide. We'll talk later. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, whores, you struck me as a tall person when I saw you, but I don't know if that was because of the heels. How, how tall are you outside of heels? The heels grow me by about eight inches. Oh, so my God. I'm only five ten. Okay. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. I think I have the smallest feet here. No, but like like uh heels. Oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> Those are platforms, right? Yeah, Please tell platforms, me they're platforms. So okay, it's, good. <laughs> it's basically like wearing a four inch heel, but they're eight inches. All right, thank you. Because I was gonna say that would be killer on your calves. Oh my god. It looks so good. <laughs> I love it. It's great. <laughs> now, when when I went to your show, I I went in cold. Like I had never been to a drag performance. I didn't know what to expect, and I was um, surprised with the lip syncing aspect of it. Like I thought people were going to be singing live, so. Yeah, so I wanted <laughs> juicy. <laughs> I could see the the, the, the disappointment for me. Yeah, so I wanted to ask that: is is drag always this type of lip synced um, performance? Or is it sometimes sung live? Lip sync is a heavy component of drag. Singers, uh, we have you know stand up comedians. We have people who do performance art. It's drag is a very versatile art form. Um, I think most people would say that lip syncing is the dominant part, of it. Okay. but I don't lip sync. And right. I'm still in drag. Yep. Right. Yep. And you're you. Um, but you were emceeing. You play the role of as the um, the host, the host, right? and the comedian, and the. Yes, and people at my shows, they like to come up to me all the time and go, "So when are you going to start performing?" And I'm like, "Motherfucker, I've been performing for three hours." <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you wouldn't you wouldn't know it by my performance on this podcast, but hosting is hard, Stomping Jen. Um, I feel like I'm floundering today. Um, I told you, I'm starstruck, um, uh, whores. That's what, that's what it is. Um, um, so, what else did I want to ask about that? Um, so, do you do you have a good sense about the history of drag and like how it? how it came to be as an art form or where it kind of sprung up from or juicy. If you know, I mean, I'm curious if either of you know, you were shaking your head juicy. I saw you. That was a yes. <laughs> I was going to defer to the performer, but I can also give like the bland, <laughs> the bland version of the history as I know it too. Do it. Um, yeah. So drag has been around forever in all sorts of different ways. You just didn't call it drag. So um, you had people who were performing, um, both embodying some form of gender divergence or gender nonconformity, but in a performing way. I want to differentiate mm -hmm. two things. One is that there's trans people who live an experience. Um, uh, and then there's the drag performer who is just changing their gender for the night, the night, the day's performance, the afternoon brunch, um, whatever it is, that, that those are two very different things. Um, and a lot of times there's a lot of language, right? language changes. Um, if you go back to the, the 80s or even back further into the 50s and the 40s, you would hear drag um, a lot. But a lot of times those people were what we would consider trans now and they would identify as trans if they had that vocabulary, but they mm -hmm. didn't. So it was just drag. Mm -hmm. um, okay. But you have just the performers who have been around for since the Greeks, <laughs> right? In various right. ways and for various reasons. Right. Sometimes it was because um, there were women uh, parts for women that weren't allowed to be played by women. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, right. Like that, that mm -hmm. goes through, but you also had um, people who just enjoyed doing it um mm -hmm. who were sort of living through an experience being what they couldn't be in the everyday yeah. um as loud and flamboyant and the star of the show the, the, um, the thing that jumps into my mind is monty python um some of some of those um male performers in that show frequently would dress up as 
women for the roles. And like, it, it wasn't a gag that they were dressing up as women. It's just that they were playing women, you know, on the show. And, you know, it was often never explained why, or, you know, it's just, it was, and, you know, it's just really, I thought that was the, I don't know if that relates in any way. Yeah. And, and I mean, that was part of what was happening, right? Is that people were allowed to dress in different ways if they were performing. So one of the things to think about, so we'll get back to Stonewall and a little bit before it, that there were all sorts of cross-dressing rules. So mm. you could not dress as a woman. Uh, if you were a man, you couldn't dress as a woman. Um, that was considered cross-dressing and it was against the law. And they would measure it out if you had three articles of clothing or more that were of the opposite sex. Oh, my God. Um, you could be arrested. Mm-hmm. However, you could cross-dress if you were performing. Hmm. Um, okay. And so part of where you get some of the lip syncing and some of that performance aspect of drag is that that was a way for people who wanted to to still cross-dress um, and do it. Without, I mean, they could still be dragged out in front for being for, for being associated with a queer or a gay bar, um, but they wouldn't be arrested for being a crossdresser. Mm-hmm. Um, so there, it, it's a tangled history. Um, but a lot of the parts that I like about drag are that it's a fun, it's a performance. You're seeing somebody's art. Um, I have tried to do drag makeup. It's hard, mm-hmm. um, but drag is also a really transgressive art form, which is what I like about it. It is, um, so like Horus mentioned, it's doing things bigger. It's pointing out the absurdity of some of these gender roles or um, aspects of gender that we've defined, that we've created. So mm-hmm. are women supposed to have big, tall hair? Well, then do it three feet up, right? Um, yeah. Make it, like exaggerate it to point out how absurd it is. Um, when you talk about um, sort of the, the more famous drag performances. You're talking about divine mm-hmm. um, <laughs> of movie fame. So like all of the weird, gross, strange things that divine did, but when it was all still critiquing, it was still making people go, Ooh, um, and then think, hopefully the, the thinking part also occurs. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's like getting a reaction, a strong reaction, and then making people think about what their assumptions are, what their thoughts are. Um, so I personally tend to gear, at least in my appreciation of it, I, I tend to, to like drag that is socially conscious, that is making a point, that is active in the queer communities um, that it's in, just for that reason. But um, there are plenty of other forms of drag. There's um, less socially critical drag. There's all sorts of ways it can take shape. Mm-hmm. Whores, do you have a way that you think of the types of performances that you put on? Would you put them in any specific category? Are you trying to um, do more social commentary? Are you trying to do just more fun shows? Is there a, how, how, how would you frame the experience you're trying to provide to people? I would say I use drag so that I can use my sociology masters. <laughs> <laughs> Every, every show that I have, we talk about issues. We talk mm-hmm. about consent. We talk about sexism. We talk about racism. We talk about isms generally because people look at bodies, people look at actions, people look at performances, and they take things for granted. Like, yeah. for instance, everyone that goes to a drag show may think drag is like only men dressing up as women when drag, in fact, is often women dressing up as women. Like, it's men dressing up as men. It's women dressing up as men. It's people dressing up as non-binary characters or genderqueer characters. There's lots of different gender variations that go into a performance of drag. And so when I do shows, I highlight that stuff. Mm -hmm. Because who's going to tell these people these kind of subtle things about gay culture and the ways you're supposed to interact with people? And I don't know. I it feels like a responsibility Mm -hmm. to entertain as well as educate. Mm -hmm. I just want to jump in because horse is being modest, (laughs) Um, but they are able to do exactly what you just said. They're able to educate and make a socially conscious show, but also keep it fun. So like, it's not an either, or you don't have to be socially conscious and, or you can be fun. You can be both. Mm -hmm. (laughs) 
I mean, that's well, the right. be- that's the best kind of message, right? That kind of I think gets to you in an ins- in in a, in, a, in a way that you're not quite realizing, right? It's getting through to you, and you know, without beating you over the head with it. It's easier to change minds that way yeah. too. I mean, some of my biggest fans that I have now are people I wouldn't expect. Like, there's a guy who comes to every single VFW show I do. He's 75 years old. <laughs> he only has ever come to anything I do. He was in the military. He grew up very conservative. And, you know, every time he has a question about something, he comes up and he asks me. Like, he's like, okay, that person right there, I don't know if they were born a man or a woman. And then I'm like, well, does it matter? And he's like, no, but I just want to know what to call them. And then, you know, we go over the thing of, well, you ask them their pronouns and they'll tell you what to call them. Mm -hmm. And it's just something no one would have ever told him before. He didn't have the experience. He wouldn't have been in a place just to ask those questions. So I I think it's just important to leave that open. Yeah. And how how do you do you recruit people for your show or do people approach you that they want to do it? Like, how do how do you get a group of people of performers to 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 be part of you know your shows so when i started doing shows we put ads on craigslist Mm -hmm. (laughs) we it was word of mouth from people who knew people because it's hard to start out in any drag community when there's already established people Mm -hmm. so i just started my own thing and then from that i've trained people i'm very conscious about training people who we don't see in our shows So if you're not seeing enough of like a certain type of person, if you feel like people are underrepresented, I want to find those people and I want to bring them in so that you can see them in the show. Mm -hmm. It's really important to me to provide mentorship, but also opportunities to people who may not have those in their tiny hometown. How did you get started? I just started, honestly. (laughs) I worked, I worked in a gay bar for a long time and it was a, it was a drag bar and we used to do this thing called switch night. Mm -hmm. So the people who worked in the bar staff would dress up and the Queens would do the bar staff stuff. And we'd like put on a show, they'd tend the bar. And so that's how I started in drag. But Mm -hmm. coming here, I just, I was like, you know, Northampton's really accepting of queer people, Mm -hmm. but where's the sexy Where's the fun? Mm -hmm. Like, I want to have fun in my community. And it didn't exist in a way that beat me over the head. So I went for it. Do you have more than the one character? I'm just whores all the time. (laughs) (laughs) Are you, Stomping Jen, are you thinking about performing? Who, me? Yeah. Oh, me? No, I hate getting in front of people. (laughs) I also hate getting in front of people. Huh? I said, I'm also a super huge introvert. We could teach you. Does, I yeah. does putting, um, whores, does putting the makeup on change that for you in any way? Once you're in costume, do you feel, how do you feel when you're in costume? Is it different? I think whores is the best parts of me exaggerated, right? So whores is the, the queer kid who didn't grow up bullied, who is confident enough to stand up for themselves all the time, who just loves everyone and wants people to kind of make the effort to get along and understand each other. Whereas is a bitter, bitter, bitter grad student dropout <laughs> working, <laughs> working in a field where people in privilege may not be the nicest. So it's nice to, you know, shake off the society garbage and just kind of be your core human. Yeah. And your partner makes all your costumes or you do it in conjunction? My partner is a mad genius. (laughs) He's not only like a really brilliant burlesque artist, but he makes everything that I wear now, including those giant bows that I put on. Mm -hmm. I think the only thing he's not doing currently is my wigs. (laughs) That's awesome, and they're amazing. Thank you. Yeah, I see one of I see one of your bows and wigs on the shelf oh, behind you. We're in my drag room right now. Yeah. <laughs> that's see, awesome. That Skeletor outfit. That's one of his burlesque outfits. Nice. Now, I think I'm thinking about the idea of 
allyship and how allies can help, right? Um, the last two podcasts we did, we had a lot of conversation around how um, allies who are interested in being anti-racists can help there. Um, but people, I mean, people who feel supportive of the LGBTQ plus community, um, what, what are some things that we can do to, to really help? Raise conscience. To raise consciousness. I can't, is it conscience or consciousness? Conscience. No. Conscience. Con- <laughs> Don't fuck me up. <laughs> All right. Whores and juicy, you got to step in and save us here. Consciousness. Consciousness. Thank you. Thank you, juicy. <laughs> I think the same, I think in general, it's the same, like allyship is pretty much the same across the board. So it's really about listening to the people who are speaking, centering their voices, understanding their needs. Um, So the same thing, you know, if you're white and you're walking into a black space, if you're straight, you're walking into a gay space. If you're a man, you're walking into a space for women. Um, If you're cisgendered and you're walking into a space for trans people, you walk in and you listen. Mm -hmm. Um, It's not about, it's not about putting your guilt everywhere and saying, I'm sorry for this. I'm sorry for Mm -hmm. it doesn't matter you should be sorry we should all be (laughs) sorry for supporting these systems um but we want to move beyond that right because just getting out your guilt just makes all the people around you feel bad too Mm -hmm. right like um so listening to people um understanding what their community means and making sure that their voices are the ones that are heard so lifting up um supporting um i think when it comes to um queer, gay, um, like all of those sort of, the, the, this this queer community, LGBTQIAA, other letters that I'm forgetting and some letters that we haven't even come up with yet, but will be added as soon as we can. Um, yeah. Like all of those things, it's just really understanding that this is a community that has been oppressed pretty much from the get-go, just like most, um, that it's full of, divergence so you'll have some people who say i am gay there are some people who say i am a lesbian there are some people who say i am queer um respecting that and learning and it's a process that whole alphabet soup is not easy to Mm -hmm. disentangle and sometimes like there's disagreements like a is twice why (laughs) um because we've we've been adding and so what is even like all of these things are all conversations that are happening so it's it's important to understand that these things are ongoing they're going to shift um, when there are victories, when we hit a milestone, there's going to be more. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, it's not one quick fight. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think educating, uh, I think good allyship actually happens outside. Um, so good allyship actually happens where there are no queer people or there are no black people. Mm-hmm. Um, because that's in a space where we don't have a voice at all. Um, or maybe there are folks in the community there, but they don't have a voice because they're afraid of reprisals. They're afraid Mm -hmm. of retaliation, whatever it is. So if you have that, the the privilege to speak up for people when they're not in the room um, and, you know, sort of bring that conversation where we can't get it. Yeah. Like go to vigils in your predominantly white community. Yeah. Like, so let's (laughs) say your friends, says something transphobic yeah. and it's just in passing and you're sitting there with two other people like you could ignore your friend or you could be an ally and be like hey that's actually pretty transphobic mm-hmm. here's several reasons why you should digest this information yeah. and those those are the important ally conversations right just like yeah. just you was saying those are the places we aren't there to be that person educating so when you're an ally you got to step up mm-hmm. yeah the- Sorry, this is. So you, can we ask about the J.K. Rowling situation? Oh, please. Because I know you had like a big post this about is, it. Yeah, I mean, your, your podcast too. Ask whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, the J.K. Rowling nonsense. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us your thoughts on that, please? It's so disappointing. Mm-hmm. It's like someone writes this kind of. And I haven't read the books. I'm going to just be that person. I haven't read the Harry Potter books, but I've seen the movies. I haven't, <laughs> so, I haven't either, whores, so you're okay, in good, good company. Good. Yeah. Well, you know, like someone creates this idea of these, these people who are overcoming this kind of dark leadership who's very anti-certain things. And then you have this author who is taking 
trans people, particularly trans women, and just raking them across the coals and saying, you're not women, you don't have periods, so you're not women. Right. Like every woman has a period, first of all. And it's just like, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. I, mm, I'm mad about it. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. And I, you know, the thing, her letter was so insidiously hateful. That's the thing that really got me. Like the thing that stuck out to me more than anything was at the very end, she goes through this, you know, um, from her perspective, probably very eloquent explanation about, you know, why her, her transphobia is justified, Mm -hmm. you know, blah, 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 blah. And then at the end, like she does this like really hateful comparison of, um, trans folks to her fictional characters. I don't know if you picked up on that. It's like in the second to last paragraph, like she compares um, trans people to her fictional characters and it was just like such a, a hateful, like insidious last stick of the knife on her way out the door with her, you know, her justification. Ugh, it got me so mad. And it was so unnecessary. It's like you needed to do this while we're having these huge Black Lives Matter moments while it's also Pride Month. Like, right. yeah. Why? And I mean, I think this is like, I mean, this isn't the first time that the J.K. Rowling has stepped into this arena of turfiness. Um, and one of the things that, you know, part of part of being an ally, part of being a supporter, um, even just part of being what I would say is just a decent person at this point is just learning. If you make a mistake, you, you apologize for it and move on. And instead, she's done exactly what, you know, I found with my students when I would introduce them to Judith Butler and all of these other um, social thinkers and all of this research sort of questioning gender and identity, um, they double down, dig in and go, I will not go further. Um, and that's what happened again. And at some point you just go like, well, you know what? <laughs> no. Yeah. No. I mean, if you look up her other pen name, it's Robert Galbraith or something like that. Mm-hmm. She named herself after the guy who created gay conversion therapy. Yeah. Which is Are you f- fucking kidding me? And she writes mystery novels or something like that under Robert Galbraith. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, it's just like what? another fucking... Yeah. And, right, and, and she ha- she had to be aware of that, right? There's yeah, no... That's yeah. That's out of a hat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, that's just a bunch of baloney. Bull baloney, as Space Unicorn likes to say. Yeah. Bull Our daughter, baloney. Space Unicorn. She like her favorite saying is bull baloney. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well that's like we were explaining to her about the Supreme Court decision and why it was good. Yeah. And she was like just the her eyes, like, what do you mean? What do yeah. you mean? Yeah. That's just bull baloney. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and despite, I mean, and this is despite the fact that we, I mean, we do have a lot of conversations in our home about these issues too. Well, plus we have a lot of gay friends. We do. I mean, I'm not saying that's like pat ourselves on the back or anything. I mean, we literally have a lot of gay friends that we socialize with. Right. So their exposure level has been high to yeah. other, you know, other types of um, family. What do they call those? Nucleuses. Family units? I don't know. what. The, what yeah. What's the soci- sociological uh, term for that? Families? Whatever. <laughs> I think I think families is, is, right. is a good word. Whatever. You're doing fine over there. All right. So, so I heard you say like a book and stuff. Like, so what resources can people use to educate themselves on, um, you know, the, the histories and, um, uh, other resources that people can tap into to kind of learn more if they're interested? Oh, there's so many. Um, if you want documentaries, I am a huge fan of uh, Before Stonewall mm-hmm. um, and um, Screaming Queens, mm-hmm. uh, which is about the Compton cafeteria riots. Um, I mean, the internet is your friend. So <laughs> go look it up. <laughs> there's so much. Uh, I mean, depending on, like, I could list out, you know, mm-hmm academic articles or 
like, um, I mean, there are historical fiction um, or not sort of, what am I thinking of? Like Milk, um, where it's like a, mm-hmm. you know, yep. a movie about a particular right. point in history. Um, Biopic? Is that what they call those? Yeah. Yes, biopics. <laughs> no, it wasn't like historical fiction. Um, I always call them biopics. And <laughs> people look at me funny, but I think it's biopic. And I feel like it's bi- biopic works. Um, like there are, um, oh, what is the, oh, Horace, help me out. What's the, the one about the trans woman who lived on, was it 35? Uh, it's the one where she like had basically a home that she created for queer people. And then Netflix did like a reboot of it too. Oh, I know what you're talking about. Is that the one that's set in San um, Francisco? Yes. In the city. It, yeah. Yes. In the city. In the city. Thank you. Uh, yeah, which with is Laura Linney. Yes. <laughs> we tried watching it. Somebody recommended it. Yes. And it was just, the acting was so terrible. It wasn't the content. It was just the <laughs> acting was like, Oh my God. Um, there is a reboot that's that's pretty good. Mm-hmm. Um, that's out on Netflix. Um, or you can read the books as well. They're really good. Yeah. Um, there are first person accounts. Um, there are shows like Pose, mm-hmm. um, which really highlight queer and people of color and how those are the folks who are sort of at the forefront of what was cool um, in the queer community as well. And just backing off of our. Will you say that piggybacking off of? I don't know. It seems like I'm drunk, but I'm not. <laughs> uh, you don't seem Paris you don't burning. seem drunk at all. Yay! What was that? Uh, Paris is burning is something. Paris that is burning. Back off the pose. It's it really gives you this documentary of ballroom culture and in mm-hmm. a time where the AIDS crisis was also rampant, and it, so much of current pop culture borrows from Paris is burning. Oh wow! And that's a that's a documentary. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I guess we wouldn't be good if we also didn't say that there's a little bit of a critique. So yes. thinking about, um, so the person who made the, the documentary um, was a white, straight, not part of the community person that came mm-hmm. in. And a lot of the folks who were in that afterwards felt like they were sort of, again, like that animal. Mm-hmm. Um, they were on display. Mm-hmm. Um, so go in with that with that lens, but also understand these were real people. Mm-hmm. Um, this was their experience. It, it's really powerful um, in terms of, of those, of capturing that moment and that energy that we have built off of. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, speaking about critiquing things, um, Stomping Jen and I are, we'll talk about this in just a few seconds. We're watching um, Pose. We're well into season two now, and we were looking up uh, some information about the show, we went to Wikipedia, right? Um, I was interested in learning more about the actors. And like, I noticed the two actors who got top billing were, you did. Thank you. The top three. The top three were the, all the white, um, straight, straight, um, actors who had small roles yes, were all above the black transgender all actors. All the black and colored people. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Um, who carried the, um, who actually carry the show who on were, their like, backs. like the main yeah. protagonist in the show. <laughs> like what the fuck? Yeah. Oh, mm-hmm. we, we were so, we were so enraged. Yeah. It's a Ryan Murphy show, right? Yes. yes. Yeah. Ryan Mor- Murphy is historically very that, I mean, we, we're not friends or anything. We haven't chatted in a while, but <laughs> the shows are very focused on white, gay experiences. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, sorry. This is like a complete aside and has yeah. nothing to do with what we're talking about. Yeah, but go ahead. <clears throat> we've watched a, couple, a number of Ryan Murphy shows and I, we're like, he gets to this point in the season, like not the first season. It's always like somewhere else that like the show just like takes some weird left turn and like goes off the deep end and you're like what the fuck it was such a good show <laughs> why am i still watching it <laughs> yeah oh my god it happens like with every show of his yeah every all of series his shows of yeah. his nip tuck was like ugh, yeah we stuck that one we stuck that one through think, though did to we the finish end. that we did one. finish that one. Oh my god yeah nip tuck we made it through the end of that one um, i mean i think ryan murphy suffers from a thing that a lot of 
um, a lot of gay men focus on when we're doing productions or things like that. And it just becomes overproduced and we want to do something super fun and dramatic that no one would ever see. Oh or think about. And then all of a sudden it takes that swerve. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's just overproduced. Like if somebody had like sat him down and been like, mm, no. no, just no. <laughs> Whole thing could have just been avoided. Yeah, not <laughs> necessary. Thank you very much. Yeah. I, I think I think he has a I'm a Ryan Murphy moment on yeah. each of his shows, and yeah. I'll do what I want to do. He really, really yeah. does. <laughs> All right. Anything else um, you want to cover under the umbrella of Pride? I mean, we've we've gone an hour and a half, if you can believe it. Um, I love. Um, I think one thing that I do want to touch on because we yeah. have um, now we have so the original pride uh, flag mm-hmm. was created, and each color had a different representation or a different meaning. Um, but the whole flag became the the gay flag, the pride flag, whatever you want to call it. Um, I think one of the things that we're seeing is as we recognize how many movements are really basically fighting the same fight we're all in the same struggle and how many how much overlap there is um in all of the different civil rights movements we have the progress flag now Mm -hmm. which is really nice it highlights the trans flag as well as including the philly pride colors which are black and brown recognizing the contribution of black and brown people to this movement in addition to the um to the other beautiful colors of the rainbow and all their meaning Mm -hmm. and I think this is sort of the, we are all evolving. We are all learning to be better people um, and to be more inclusive in our communities. And it's a process. And mm-hmm. so now we have, you know, there was a, a couple of years ago that the Philly pride came out, uh, the, the Philly pride flag came out and there was a huge backlash. There were a whole bunch of, of gay white men who were like, Oh no, don't put politics into my pride. <laughs> is that, yeah. I remember that controversy quite well. What? The what? Controversy. <laughs> okay, controversy, fine. <laughs> yes. Um, okay, but, so the progress flag. Um, yeah, so okay. like we're, we're all evolving. Um, mm-hmm. We're all learning. It's a process. It's not just... So if somebody uh, maybe walks into a space and they hear a whole bunch of words that they don't know, it's okay. Nobody knew those words when they walked in there the first time. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes those things change too. So I personally, I love the, when people describe themselves as gender fuckery or gender fucks or gender fucking, I love it. It's great. It's so much more fun to me than gender fluid. I'm not going to make anyone identify as it though, but like, just like, I just like, wait, that's a possibility. That's an option. Like, let me go check that out. <laughs> and see, that sounds like a cool club. I like um, that. Gender fuckery. Gender fuckery. I like it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, just all of Pride is just a chance to, to relearn the past, but also to look forward to what we can do or what we can be. Um, and the recognition, it's going to take some work. It's not easy, yeah. mm-hmm. but we can all do it. Okay. I Thanks, Juicy. Yeah, thank you. Horrors, anything um, you want to add at the end here? I got nothing. I've talked so much. <laughs> And thank you. I, no, I mean, really, um, I appreciate it. Um, especially, we appreciate, it. we appreciate this. Yeah, uh, you know, we're recording this at the end of a long work day, so having anybody willing to spend more than an hour and a half with us. Yes. Now we do have this silly segment we do at the end, um, where we talk about just what we're watching on TV, or listening to music, that kind of thing that we want to rec- want to recommend to people. So yes. we'll do it. We'll, we'll do it real quick. He has a bumper. This is my bumper. He I really wanted you to hear my bumper. He's very, very I'm very obsessed. proud of my, my segment bumpers. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This one's very long, <laughs> yeah, though. So I'm we're gonna not going to over yet. Gonna we're going to fade, fade it out. out. Okay. We're going to fade it out. She won't let me play my bumpers. <laughs> All right. Um, so as we mentioned, we are yeah. finishing the, the rest of Pose. Yeah, we're... Season two. In season two... It's we're um, sticking whoops, it out. I need to fade a little more. Um, we're sticking it out. I'm enjoying it quite a bit. Yeah. Um, First season's incredible. Yeah. Um, I love the show. Yeah. I think um, it has really challenged me in some ways. Um, 
you know, kind of, um, how do I want to frame this? I think I was uncomfortable at first when I started watching it because I haven't seen a lot of depictions of, um, in, in, I don't know. Being conscious that it is a it is a white male, um, a gay white male who makes this show. I don't know if the depictions in it um, are, are authentic or they can be representative of any group of people. I just want to say that, but um, I have n- not been exposed to a lot of um, shows that feature you know that kind of um, open um, you know. Um, uh, same gender expressions of love and affection and sex and, um, you know, transgender people. And um, it was, you know, I have to say, like, when I first started watching it, you know, like, I was sort of feeling maybe, like, a little uncomfortable. Did it feel vo- voyeuristic to you? Um, I just didn't quite, like, know how to feel. I don't know. Like I felt, I don't can't quite say why I felt uncomfortable. Like I haven't been able to get to that. I have therapy tomorrow. I'm going to talk about this with my therapist <laughs> actually. <laughs> um, but no, um, but at, at, you know, a few episodes in that kind of like disappeared for me. Right. And I'm like really not even conscious anymore in a sense of, um, of that. You know, I don't know how to quite say it. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, (laughs) I just, I I don't know. Like, the show made me, just made me initially... It challenged your perceptions of people. Thank you. There you go. Yeah, thank you. And (laughs) um, now I just love the show and, like, I Mm -hmm. I feel like I just... Because it's like insight into a whole other culture that we don't get. Yeah. We're not not pretty to see. I mean, and... Uh, you know, I laugh at Sawtooth because he, I was like, oh, the best part of this show is the soundtrack. And he's like, I don't, I don't know any of these songs. I'm like, didn't you grow up in the same era as me? I don't understand how you don't yeah. know any of this music. I know the songs in season two. Well, cause it's in the nineties. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, he's uh, old. Oh my gosh. Um, but I'm younger yeah. than you and I knew the music. But anyways, like, I just, I absolutely love the show. So you guys have seen the show or no? Cause <laughs> I've seen it, yeah. Yeah. I, my, I just, I love in second season when they're talking about, like, Madonna and Vogue and, like, when yeah. Vogue came out and, like, how it was, like, they were so excited that it was going to bring yeah. uh, the ballroom culture into the mainstream um, and they were going to get some recognition. That was such an interesting yeah. concept because I would have been like, fuck you, get away. Like the looky loses, they called them, you know, like that they yeah. stormed the ballroom. I'd be like, get the fuck out. Yeah. This is our thing, right? But they loved it. In the show, they loved it. I don't know if that was true in real life. I have no idea. I'm not even real. I'm not asking anybody. I'm just yeah. <laughs> speculating out loud. I have no idea. Yeah, but then all the white ladies at the YMCA right, all the wanted to take the, the Vogue classes. Right, and then it... Yes. The Vogue, dan- the the Vogue, Vogue dance. The Vogue dance classes. I mean, that's sort of the, the transmission, though, right? So, like, I'm not going to say that queer people of color are the only people who have fun, great ideas, but a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we do fun stuff, and we get involved, and we make something that's really great, and then... You know, in this case, like, here comes a white lady with a little bit of power and she takes it. And then right. all of a sudden, it's a cool white thing. Right. <laughs> and, you know, it's it's no longer the bad thing that it was. It's no longer the dishonorable or just taste or disgusting. Right. It's like, oh, yeah, that, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. And it's the same with drag, right? Like, RuPaul's Drag Race comes on. All of a sudden, drag's biggest fans are 12-year-old white girls. Oh and you're like, wow, how did this happen? Yeah. Mm-hmm. it's crazy pop culture is crazy yeah so we were debating does anyone know is there a season three of pose out does anyone know we couldn't we were talking we about this last night we didn't bother to look at it it was just a lazy question look. we're just <laughs> seeing the season three okay all right i'm gonna google it though <laughs> <laughs> thank um. you thank you internet <laughs> preach <laughs> yeah. it's not out yet but i could be yeah well i think because i told you so what 
I had watched season one of Pose like months and months ago. And then he was like, oh, we should watch it. And yeah. I said, I'm pretty sure I watched all of it already. So I didn't realize that I hadn't seen season two because that was out on FX yeah. at the same time. I mean, the thing that I didn't anyway. even know what it was about. The thing yeah. I saw a headline that said, you have to watch this uplifting show. Uplifting? That. Well, that's what I read. And I was like, we had just, we had just finished watching a series that I was really, really taken with called Patriot on Amazon prime. Um, it's a spy show. That's not really a spy show. Um, and if you want to hear more about it, go back a few episodes. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you you'll heal me. You, you, you will hear me wax on <laughs> for a long time about it. But, um, anyways, I had no idea what really what it was about and started watching it yeah. and fell in love with it. So. Yeah. But last night we watched um, Vast of Night. The Vast of Night. Do you it's... like science fiction? I do. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. So this is on Netflix? No, it's no, on Amazon, Amazon Prime. Prime. Yeah, called Vast of Night. It's really good. It's a movie, but it sort of feels like a extended um, uh, Twilight Zone episode. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, it's new, and it's another thing I saw advertised as like the best movie of the year. Yeah, no, it and was the, really good. The first half of it goes so fast, and you're like, "What the fuck is going on? Why am I watching this? I have no idea." And then it sort of slows way down, and yeah. then it sucks you in, and then yeah. it ends, and then you're like, <gasps> yeah. "What just happened? <laughs> Crazy!" Yeah. So, anything you all want to recommend? Start uh, with whores. So if you love Pose, you should find a friend who has HBO, which is what I did. And I've been watching this show called Legendary, which is where oh. actual ballroom houses are competing against each other. Oh. Actual ballroom competition. I think they started with like 10 teams and they're on week three right now. Okay. But it is phenomenal. It is so good. Are they like a- are actual, like real ballroom? Um... Oh, yes. Okay. They're all real ballroom houses that come to compete in a bunch of different categories. And it's really interesting to watch because like the judging panel is one person from ballroom and then three kind of celebrities who don't have as much ballroom experience. So you okay. see her educating them a lot and explaining the challenges and kind of like figuring out what ballroom's really about mm-hmm. for these viewers who have never seen it before which is great oh cool cool we'll check it out yeah legendary on hbo and also if you want to see drag that will challenge your views of drag you should watch dragula Hmm. dragula is kind of like a drag show meets fear factor and they do a bunch of crazy drag things that you'd be like i didn't even realize that was something you could do with drag oh cool Okay, Dragula. What's that on? What? It's I think Dragula is on Netflix right now. Netflix. But oh, nice. Okay. Netflix and YouTube. Oh, and YouTube. <laughs> awesome. So many streaming services. It's hard. And then you know, if you track. like music, I'm big into recommending black and queer artists right now. Mm-hmm. So you need to get on Big Frida, like it was ten years ago. Big. Because Big Frida yeah. is influencing Beyonce right now. She's influencing Drake. She's like influencing all these mainstream, huge, successful pop people, but they're not featuring her face, just her voice. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Big Frida. Is that how do I spell the last name? F R E E D I A. I think. Oh, I was yep. way off. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Big Frida. All right. What about um, um, Juicy? What about you? Wow. Oh, well, you stole my uh, <clears throat> my Dragula recommendation. I'm sorry. Uh, and one of the great th- I'm going to second Dragula because it also highlights. It's not just if you go through all the seasons. It's not just all cis men mm-hmm. um, that are performing, but it's got all of the. It's got drag queens. It's got drag kings. It's just got drag performers. Um, who are non-binary it's wonderful um and it's weird which is also great and the boulet brothers put on a great show they also do a halloween show in boston if people are ever interested in going more than happy to drag along um (laughs) (laughs) no pun intended (laughs) (laughs) um in terms of tv shows or things on netflix um i would recommend disclosure i just watched it two nights ago. Um, it's a documentary, but it's, um, about trans representation in media. 
um, it does touch on all of the other things, so race and, and mm -hmm. sex and um, power um, and, you know, trans erasure and all of those things. Um, I also like when there's a queer, like when there's a queer moment in movies or film or when there's, when it's, when it's there, but it's not the center of the story mm -hmm. because like we're queer people, we are, we, we live right. <laughs> we're everywhere. Um, yeah. So on Netflix, both She-Ra and mm. there's a show, uh, Kipo and the Age of Wonder Beasts. Mm -hmm. And they both have queer characters and the queerness is just sort of there. Yep. It's not like, it's not the thing that moves the story along. Um, and I'll also say, if you don't mind watching foreign mil uh, movies and you're able to sort of go with the subtitles, The Way He Looks, uh, which is on Netflix, or at least it was, um, is really good. Um, and it also is about ability. It's uh, Without giving away the plot points, there's a, a blind child in Brazil. Okay. Um, and he's sort of coming of age. <laughs> okay. I, I just have to comment. So Space Unicorn, our daughter... Um, uh, I was like, we should watch She-Ra because I heard good things about it and I love She-Ra growing up and blah, 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 blah. And so we watched the first episode together and then she proceeded to like binge watch the entire mm -hmm. thing. She loves and it. And I was like, you totally watch that without me. And she's like, I'll watch it with you again. And I'm like, nope, you watched it already. <laughs> so mad. But yeah, I'll go back and watch it with her. Yeah. <laughs> It's a good, I mean, it's got a little bit of the nostalgia from Shira. You're like, hey, I recognize those names. They might look a little different. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of messages of empowering um, mm -hmm. young women, which is great. And again, without spoiling things, there's some queerness, but it's thrown in. It's not a plot point that moves the, the show forward. Mm -hmm. It's just, it just is. Yeah. Netflix is so good at that right now, too. That Netflix is full of really tangentially queer things that just make you go, Oh, look, representation. That's fucking great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. That's, That's awesome. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'll be honest. He's done. I'm exhausted. He's like, I can see that <laughs> yeah. look in your eye. Like, oh, I'm done. Yeah. And you know, part of it is cause I had to do a lot of thinking here and I think that's a, that's, <laughs> that's a, a good podcast. That's, that's a, a good podcast. A good podcast. I mean, you, you know, smoke was pouring out of my ears. What? So. <laughs> so silly. All right. Well, I want to just take a minute at the end here to thank these fine guests. Yeah. Did you ask them if they want to promote anything? Oh, <laughs> Stomping Jen. Uh, thank you. Sorry. You're the best. <laughs> um, whores Divorce. I didn't screw that up once, by the That's way. Great. Congratulations. Is there <laughs> Anything you would like to promote as we are on our way out? So once we're out of quarantine, you can come visit me for Drag Brunch with Whores and Friends at Slancha Restaurant in Holyoke, Massachusetts. We do one show a month there. You can also find me at the Majestic Saloon for Divorce Court Charity Drag Show and at the Florence VFW for the House of Whores Productions, which include Bon Appetit Burlesque. And I will say, um, the drag show that I attended at Schlanta was amazing. It was a lot of fun. I had never been to one before, as yeah. I said before. I didn't know what to expect, and it was a blast. Yes. Don't go to any other shows other than mine, or you'll be very disappointed. <laughs> yeah. If you go to any, yeah. If you go to another show, you get this. That's right. Don't do it, people. Only whores divorce shows got it okay all right all right um thank you whores i really appreciate you coming on here to talk with us um thank you both for having me does juicy have anything he wants to promote? juicy d <laughs> i know i should but i don't have much to promote at the moment so just promote your awesomeness yeah um and all of the virtual prides that you see all across facebook instagram tiktok anything like that Go watch, learn, engage, support those organizations, especially now, um, because a lot of them rely on in-person donations and they can't do that right now. So yeah. go and go have a good time. It's fun to watch people do what they do. Yeah. Agreed. 
Um, Juicy, thank you so much. We really appreciate you spending some time with us. Okay. And listeners, you know we love you. We love you. We love that you are there listening, (laughs) receiving our knowledge and our sounds into your ear canals. Oh, my gosh. Penetrating your ears. Oh, my Lord. With our words. Our children are... are, We love you. are, ...are losing their shit upstairs. All right. All right. Whores, juicy. Thanks again, and be well. Okay, we love you, and we love you all. Bye now. Bye now.